Welcome to the Creative Homeschool Podcast. In this podcast, I'm coming at you to deliver you a weekly dash of creativity to make your homeschool exciting for your kids, but for you too. We're going to explore all of the different ways to creatively homeschool. Games, field trips, unit studies, writing activities, kid businesses, art, and more. I'm your host, Julie Soule, longtime homeschool mom, shenanigan enthusiast, espresso drinker, and founder and co-owner of Soul Spark Let's Art. I've helped thousands add creativity and joy to their homeschool, and I'm ready to help you too. Ready to get started? Let's go. Hello and welcome to the Creative Homeschool. I am thrilled to welcome the incredible Emily Cook. Emily is the force behind one of the most incredible and booktastic secular curriculums out there, Build Your Library. Designed for K through 12, this literature based program is infused with the teachings of Charlotte Mason. She's also the creator and author of Lit Bites, Build Your Library Unit Studies, History Book by Book, and the YouTube channel ARG Schooling, which I know is how so many of us feel. Welcome, Emily. I'm so thrilled to have you here. Thank you for inviting me. So, First, I want to talk about Charlotte Mason. You mentioned mm-hmm. that Build Your Library is a curriculum infused and inspired by Charlotte Mason. So who or what is Charlotte Mason for those who aren't familiar? Charlotte Mason was a British educator at the turn of the century, and she was very much ahead of her time in her ideas about how children learn. And, you know, they're not buckets that you just have to fill up with knowledge. They're their own people who are capable of coming to their own thoughts and conclusions, making their own connections and that sort of thing. I think what she gets known for a lot in the homeschooling world is living books, narration, copy work, dictation, and nature study. Those are like the things that I think people most associate with Charlotte Mason. And I also see a lot of dogma attached to her, like you have to use the books that she used and you have to follow the same exact coursework that she used in her schools. And I don't think if Charlotte Mason were alive today, I don't think she would agree with that. I think she would want us to use what we have now and the available books that are living books today. And so that's part of what I do. I want to bring Charlotte Mason into the modern day. I don't think we need to be stuck in this little bubble of classics and old ideas. I think we can have all of the new ideas and new information and still follow living books. We still use dictation and copy work and narration and still get out in nature and learn about that. But you don't have to be stuck in the past to do it. Now, you mentioned living books. So what is a living book? If I'm looking at all of my book collections to figure out, how would I find one? A living book is one that is written by somebody who is passionate about their subject matter. So a living book can be anything. It doesn't have to be a piece of literature. It can be nonfiction. But the idea is that where a textbook is written by a committee of people and it's written in a very stilted manner, like very academic text, kind of hard to read, makes you feel like you maybe aren't smart enough to understand it. Or a living book is one that draws you in and makes you care about the topic you're reading about and gets you excited about it. You can tell the writer is excited about what they're writing about. And I know when they're excited, we're excited. Exactly. I know I want to dive into books with you because I know that's your favorite topic. But the first thing I wanted to mention is you've done it. You have homeschooled those later teenage years. In fact, you've homeschooled for 21 years now. Now three have graduated. Hmm. Your youngest is starting high school. So I would love Hmm. to know, what would you say to all of those homeschoolers out there or whether they're homeschooling now or maybe they're considering homeschooling for those later years who are worried, well, if I homeschool those later years, my kids will never get into college or my kids will never get a real job. What would you say to them? Well, I would say that that isn't true (laughs) and that homeschooling through the high school is definitely possible. High school sounds scary. It feels intimidating because we're thinking in terms of, well, now it counts because now this matters to colleges and that sort of thing. But like, if you've been doing this all along, then you can keep going because you already know what you're doing. You already have the rhythm in place. You already 
know your child and you know their passions and all of that. And so you can easily develop a high school curriculum for them based on that. Like it's not that much different from what you've been doing all along. You just have to be a little more organized and be able to format into a transcript what they've done. But honestly, transcripts are not as scary as we think they are. I've done them and I am not an organized person. I managed to pull it together and I had two children go to college. One graduated and one is graduating next year. And so it's been done. It worked and you can do it. It becomes a little bit more of overseeing their success than the one-on-one teaching at the table yes. in those later years. Too. You definitely. definitely become more of a mentor. You're there to guide them. I think of it more as like, I'm now the guidance counselor, flash, sometimes teacher, but it's a lot more of a background role. I'm more guiding them and figuring out what they want to do. A lot of it is like figuring out what their goals are and then helping them to get that pathway to get to that goal. I was having a conversation with another homeschooling friend last week that one of our purposes when we're homeschooling kids is to set them up for those opportunities Mm -hmm. and for those situations, for those things that they're really interested in. Because in school, it's often presented to them. But one of the trickiest things as homeschoolers, but also one of the most rewarding is the fact that we get to set up our kids with those things. So I'm curious, what were your kids interested in? Do you have a couple of examples of opportunities that you saw out with? Okay, my oldest, she graduated college last May and she graduated with a degree in creative writing. She has always wanted to write. She used to write little stories when she was very small. She learned to write, like physically write, because she needed to put her thoughts on paper. (laughs) So she's been writing for forever. And so I worked with her a lot on her creative writing. She had to take some classes to figure out how to get her writing to be academic writing because she wanted to put her flair and her creativity into everything. And it's like, well, sometimes you have to write back. <laughs> you can't I am laughing that. because one of my degrees is in creative writing. And I <laughs> also struggled with this. And I went to public school, but I struggled with this whole idea that I had to be forced into that academic writing mold. So we don't have the video with this, but I'm laughing over here because I feel so sweet. So like that was a big part of what she did gearing up to finding a school to go to. And so we looked for a school that had a really good creative writing program. And she went to an art school that had a creative writing department. And it was such a perfect fit for her. And it was a very small school. And it just worked out really well. She was able to get a lot of eyes on her writing and learn about critiques and that sort of thing, which isn't something I could give her as a homeschool parent. I can tell you that I think it's good, but it's really important for especially creative writing to have other people read your writing and point things out to you. And so that was a big component that was missing from what I could give her that she got in college. And so then my next oldest decided that art was her thing. And it's funny because for years, the twins were really heavily into music. And we thought that's the path that we were on. And then all of a sudden, ninth grade, they both went, yeah, not really. (laughs) Wait, are you saying it's okay to switch gears? It is okay to switch gears. And it's so funny. It was literally a switch got flipped. And they were like, this is fun, but not a job. And so they didn't want to keep doing it anymore. And then my daughter, who is graduating next year, went to the same art school and is graduating with a degree in illustration, but she also really wants to go into animation. So she's been taking a lot of animation classes and that sort of thing. So I geared everything in high school towards art because I knew that was her passion. That's what she wanted to do. And so we took art classes. I signed her up at the local high school because at the time they had a really great art teacher there who I knew would be great for helping her figure out portfolio and stuff. Because when you go to an art college, they want a portfolio. I don't know how to put together an art portfolio, but they do. (laughs) They had a class for that at the high school, an AP art portfolio class. So I set that up. She took classes at the high school specifically just for art because I knew that that was a component 
that I couldn't provide, but that they could. They also helped her to get a scholarship too. So she won some awards for her artwork through that and was able to get a scholarship. So don't be afraid to outsource. If you find that there is something that you just can't teach or that you don't feel comfortable teaching, find a class for that. Sometimes it'll be through your local high school. Sometimes it'll be an online teacher. There's lots and lots of options available. Don't feel intimidated by taking on something that you can't do. Look for someone who can. I'm really thrilled that you opened up the dialogue about that because sometimes we really feel like we have to do everything and there's that panic. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why we're asked as homeschoolers, as soon as you announce that you're homeschooling, people tend to ask you how you're going to possibly teach calculus. And oh, yeah, that's always the first thing they ask. And it's like, well, I won't have to. That's for me to find for them, but I don't have to teach it. Well, why is it always calculus and physics? I don't know. They always try to find what's the hardest thing that they know you can't do. (laughs) Started reading a book on quantum physics, which has an entire first section about physics. So now if anyone ever says the physics part, I'll be like, I've got it. I've got it. I am outsourcing chemistry, though, because I don't have enough patience to do the lab experiments. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to blow my house up when you're a homeschooler. That's a, you know, Mm -hmm. you don't really have the equipment. No. Okay. I want to go into your curriculum, which has been an incredible success. So you've helped kids learn history, science, geography, language arts, and more, and all through books. So Mm -hmm. I would love to know what inspired you to start Build Your Library. And for our listeners who aren't familiar with it, who is it perfect for? I started Build Your Library because I knew that I wanted this one particular kind of program, and it didn't exist. When I first started homeschooling, I found out about Charlotte Mason, and I thought that was amazing. Why didn't I know about this sooner? I want to do that. And then I started looking for curriculum for that. And all of it was very, very religious. And I didn't want that. I'm a secular homeschooler. I didn't want a curriculum that I would have to pick apart so much. And that's what I did for years, was just pick things apart and put them back together again. And it got to a point where I was like, why am I doing this? I can do this myself. I know what I want something to be. So I'll just write it myself. And I did that for a little while. And then I'm like, I know I'm not the only one looking for this. I'm going to go ahead and try to put this together for other people to use too, so that I'm not the only one struggling here. I want to share it with someone else. And so I started it, oh God, like 11 years ago, I think. And it started out just like levels one and five. Because I wanted to start with a beginner level and I was using level five with my twins at the time. So I was like writing for what we were going to be doing, but also like a younger level. And I just did that for years until I got all of the levels completed. And I would say Build Your Library is great if you are looking for a literature based curriculum that does not hawk a religion at you. <laughs> like you don't have to have any religious worldview to use it. You can use it if you are Catholic, if you are Jewish, if you are completely atheist. It doesn't matter because I'm not here to tell you what to believe. I'm just giving you a curriculum and you can add your own worldview in. And I would say it's for anyone who wants to raise a child who loves to read. Even if you think your child doesn't like to read, I would say give it a try because I myself have children who are reluctant readers who have learned to love books. Even if they don't read all the time, my adult children still talk about the books that they've loved and their career paths are all on a trajectory of stories. So even if you think that your child doesn't love to read and you love to read and you want to inspire them to love to read, I would say give Build Your Library a try. I'm aware that Build Your Library is secular. I'm also a secular homeschooler, but I love the fact that you mentioned that it's not that you can't use it if you have a certain religious homeschooling that you love to do. It comes without it and you can add it in. Yes. And I love that. So I'm really glad that you brought that up because I think sometimes everything feels like it's secular or religious and people forget that you can add things like that to You started with first and fifth. I was going to ask, I was like, were those the ages of your kids? But I love how you started at the beginner too. So you felt like you had a beginning and then this grew with your family. Yeah. 
I know Soul Thrive Blitz Art started out for a similar reason. I was looking for something that I needed that didn't exist. And then I wanted to be able to give it to others. That's what homeschool parents do. We yes. have to make what works for our family. And then sometimes we innovate. <laughs> yeah. The world is a better place because you have chosen to share your gift with the world. You don't only have the full year lesson plans, you have a whole library of unit studies too. And mm-hmm. I just first introduced to you through your prehistory unit study, which my girls both loved. And now you have Lit Bites. And mm-hmm. so what's the difference between your unit studies and your Lit Bites and your curriculum? The full year curriculum is exactly that. It's a full year. It's 36 weeks and you're going to get a whole bunch of subjects, a lot of material. A unit study is similar in format to a full year level. It's going to have a lot of different components to it, but it's on a topic. So you're not just getting one book. You're getting a book with lots of other books to go with it to cover a topic. And a lit bite is just one single book study. So instead of having a full-blown unit, you're just getting a literature unit to go with one book. And these came about because when I was doing updates, I was getting a lot of questions from people all the time saying like, when you write a level, what happens to the books that don't make it in? And I'm like, well, sometimes a book is good. It just didn't fit here, but I still wanted to do something with it. I just didn't know what. And so eventually I said, well, what if I just made a unit just for that? And that way we have these little tiny units of literature that maybe you were reading a book in a level and you didn't like it or your child was not enjoying it and you drop it. Well, what do you do with those two to three weeks of empty space in your level now? You can use a lit bite and put that in that spot instead. So that gives you something that's already done for you. You don't have to make up your own unit. You don't have to think about what book to read. You can just swap in a lit bite. And it gives me an excuse to finally do something with these stacks of books that I collect because I want to use it for something. I'm like, this sounds like it'll work somewhere. And I'm like, well, what do I do with it now? Now that it didn't fit anywhere. So now I get to go through all those books and read them. And it's always fun for me because I love middle grade literature. I love young adult. I love children's books. So it gives me an excuse to keep purchasing these things because my children have all outgrown them at this point. My youngest being 14, she's not really reading a ton of middle grade anymore, which makes me sad because I have a huge library of middle grade books. So now I get to still read them. I noticed that you mentioned that someone might not care for a book in Mm -hmm. your curriculum. So are you saying it's okay to stop reading a book that you don't like? Absolutely. I am a big fan of putting down a book that you are not enjoying. Because if I can't get through a book, I can't expect my children to get through a book that I'm not enjoying. And if they're hating a book, they're getting nothing out of it. If you're reading something that is boring you to the point where you don't care what's happening anymore, then why are you reading it? I don't understand how people can push themselves through a book they're not enjoying because that's not a skill I have ever been able to do. If I'm not liking it, I don't finish it. So if you are using Build Your Library or any literature-based curriculum, honestly, and you're reading a book that was assigned and your child hates it or you hate it, it is perfectly fine to close that book put it down and pick something up that you know you will enjoy. Including one of her lit bites, because that's really a brilliant idea to have something there for those times. So has there ever been a book that you can remember that you slog through because you're like, I just want to say that I finished this. I have one book that I did this with. So I'm curious if you have. Oh my gosh. I'm sure that I have. But the problem with that question is that if I'm not enjoying a book, it's gone. It's all thought of it. I don't remember. I can't think of one off the top of my head. You know what? I'm going to say probably a separate piece. And I can't even tell you the author of that book, but I remember I that. that. somebody told me it was their favorite book and it was on so many lists that I was like, fine, I'll pick it up. And I don't understand why anyone, <laughs> I did finish it, but I finished it and closed the book and forgot all about it. So it did nothing for me. And everybody has such different tastes. The one that I remember making myself finish was Anna Karenina. Oh, I did not finish that. I own it. I think I still have it. I could not. I tried. I gave it a good try. I really enjoyed Crime and Punishment in my 12th grade AP English class. Why? I don't know. I think I've always liked books with a psychological bent. So the idea behind that book was fascinating to me. 
So I thought I would read more Russian literature as an adult. And I picked up Anna Karenina. Not the same thing. That was my no. slog. But the one that I'm probably going to get absolutely butchered for saying, but I'll say it here just to keep myself humble and vulnerable. I cannot read A Catcher in the Rye. I know everyone loves it. I, I've i never read that. I'm actually afraid to pick it up because I know I'm going to hate it. And I'm just like, I don't know if I want to put myself through that. I feel like it's one of those books that's overrated, possibly. But yeah. So if you have any hate mail and you're listening, just send it to me. I'm just glad that I mentioned this because now I know that Emily and I are going to become even better friends because we're going to share this. I think you're the first person who has ever told me that. Everyone really? talks about <laughs> this book. And it's always that conversation I try to dodge when someone asks me my literature spitballs. And so I feel like this whole day is made just from that. You have a lot of books and you just started recently a used bookstore online. I did. Yep. So are these books from the curriculum, extra books that you um, picked up during the years? Sometimes I have a lot of books and sometimes I end up buying duplicates of things because I thought I didn't have it anymore and then I buy another copy and then the other one turns up. So that happens a lot. Mostly though, what happened was for years, I have talked about wanting to open my own bookstore. And I started Build Your Library as a way to save money for that. I thought maybe I could put away some money and that would help me to fund the purchase of a building or some kind of lease a building. I don't know. I wanted a bookstore. And that's just something that I've always wanted to do. But it just doesn't seem like it's going to happen at this point. I'm just I'm kind of over it. At this point, I don't think it's going to happen. But now I have a storage unit full of books that I've collected over the years. I go to thrift stores. I go to library sales. Our town, we have to bring our garbage to a dump. And they have a little area at the place where you can leave things. And a lot of times people leave books. And they're there for free to just take whatever you want. And so I would go through the books and take That's things. dangerous. I've been squirreling away books for years. And we have a storage unit <laughs> that... It's full of books. And I'm like, what do I do with this? So after talking about it for a while, we decided, what if we started an online bookstore? And that would give me an excuse to clean out the storage unit and clean out some of my shelf space. Because I don't have any shelf space anymore. I'm going to be completely honest. My house is as full as it can be of books. <laughs> so you can't I am just but totally Emily sitting stuff. there and the whole wall behind her is yeah. all books. <laughs> with the requisite owl for the bookcase. Is that yeah. that's a requirement. I also yeah. have an owl on my bookcase. I have multiple owls on my bookcases. They're everywhere. So like at this point, I just need to do something because there's too many books. And so I'm like, what if I start calling my shelves, going through the storage unit, pulling things out, and I'll put them up for sale. And so that's what it is. It's honestly just me trying to clean out, but also I want to do something with it. Not just, I don't know. I wouldn't even know what to do with this many books at this point. What else do you do besides open a bookstore? <laughs> There's too many. I don't know how to donate that many books. So that is a really good question because I also have a need to call from library book sales where I used to, when I first learned about library book sales, I they're so dangerous. a lot of fantasy, but I would buy the second book and the fifth book because that's what I found. Mm -hmm. And I was yes, I've done that so confident many I was going to find the first, third and fourth. It was just magically going to happen. And guess what? Spoiler alert. Yeah, I've done that a lot. Yeah. So I'm feeling you on that one. And for anyone who's interested in purchasing one of her incredible books, all of these links are going to be in the show notes. I'm going to have your curriculum and also your bookstore. We'll have all of those. So check out those show notes. You had to have started somewhere. So at some point, you were a little girl and you thought, I like reading. Is there a book that you remember that was just a huge favorite for you as a kid? I'm thinking now. I've been a reader since I could read. I started reading when I was like four years old. And I've just always been that bookworm. The books that stick out in my memory from my childhood is Jillian Jiggs. It was this picture book I had, Jillian, Jillian, Jillian Jiggs. It looks like your room has been lived in by pigs. And it's this little girl who is just constantly inventing new things to do and creating these crazy imaginative playscapes with her friends. And so every time her mother walks in the room, it's messier than it was before. 
<laughs> just related to that. That was my first favorite picture book that I can remember. And for a chapter book, I'd say the book that sticks out for me from my childhood would be, well, what is it called? Sixth Grade Secret by Louise Zekar. And I don't even know why that was a favorite book, but I read that book hundreds of times. I would just finish it and start it back over. And just, I read it to pieces and that I found a copy a couple of years ago and I bought it and I handed it to my oldest. I'm like, this is my favorite book. <laughs> but she read it. And, and what she, did your she was think? like, I guess it's fine. And <laughs> so, yeah, my youngest read it and thought it was okay. And I'm like, was this just me? Like, I don't know. I just loved it. It was a story about these kids in a sixth grade class who invented these secret clubs. And then they had this gang war against each other, fighting it out who was the best club. And it was this whole elaborate, I don't know, the idea of having a secret club was very exciting to me, I guess, when I was younger. So, you know, I heard the Babysitter's Club. I remember reading that whole series. Mm. And then I never got into that, but I did read a few of the Sweet Valley High. Oh my gosh, you were going to remember those. Yes, I had all of those except for one of them. One of them I was not allowed to get. I don't remember why, but my friends and I all read it and our parents all decided that there was one book that had a topic in it that they felt was not. I think, I mean, they were high schoolers. So, and I was probably mm -hmm. 10. So I could only imagine. But yeah, the Sweet Valley High books, I remember every single time anyone came out going to the bookstore at our mall, back when people went to the malls and going oh, to the yeah. bookstore behind the glass elevator with my oh, gosh. first and 50 cents plus tax. <laughs> I miss bookstores at the mall. That was my favorite place to go. I used to hide there all the time. I would just go to the mall just to go to the bookstore and lurk around. I didn't even buy anything. I never had money for books when I was growing up. It was always the library for me, but I loved going to the bookstore. And I will say my parents never told me I couldn't read something. That's just, I don't know, maybe that's an anomaly. I don't know. Maybe that's just my family, but I was never told I couldn't read something. So I read a lot of stuff growing up that probably I shouldn't have, but I did. You so I remember once. picking up weird romance stuff that my aunt had on her shelves. I read Stephen King when I was 11 and 12 years old. That's I like read romance a lot. <laughs> I got a whole stack of those from one of my cousins when I was in high school. So you learn a lot. You learn a lot from books. <laughs> yes. And so have your kids enjoyed any of your favorites? I know you mentioned that they broke your heart with this poor, poor book. Yeah, that the sixth grade secrets didn't really inspire them that much, I guess. But that's fine. That was a weird book. I don't know why that was my favorite. But no, they have enjoyed a lot of my favorite. Yeah, I've, I've introduced them to things that I'm like, this is my favorite thing. Please don't break my heart. <laughs> so we would read it together. And I don't know, maybe my passion came through in the reading, but they've mostly enjoyed the things that I've enjoyed. So what else? You have another three that have been favorites for your kids and you? Yeah. One of my all-time favorite books is Watership Down. And I read that to my kids when they were younger and they all really loved it. I'm reading it right now with my youngest because I'm like, it's time. I think you're ready. Let's do it. So we're reading Watership Down right now. And that is probably one of my all-time favorite books. It's just a beautiful piece of literature and I want them to love it. So I do my best to give it the reading it deserves and share it with them. So that's probably one of my favorite books to read aloud. I have never read that, but I remember that my brother had to read that in high school. I was assigned it to read in seventh grade and I hated it. I thought it was beneath me. Why would I want to read a book about rabbits? Silly. And so I remember like, scoffing at the teacher and acting like I was better than this book. And then I came back to it as an adult and was like, wow, what was my problem? Well, they weren't bragging. Anything. That's why. Yeah. It's not like middle school is not the time for that. <laughs> well, I know Wings of Fire is a really super popular series now with kids. And my kids haven't read them yet. But my understanding is Talking Gurgans. Is that about right? I'm Pretty sure. My kids never got into that series. My oldest daughter was really into the Warriors. Okay, that was cat. another one that I was thinking about yeah. when you were mentioning yeah. the rabbits. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, speaking of talking animals, I think 
we were talking right before I hit record that James of the Giant Peach is one of the mm-hmm. first books that I remember reading when I was a kid and just loving. But another one that was one of my favorites was Benicula. Oh, Benicula is such a fun, underrated book. <laughs> And there's a talking dog and mm-hmm. cat. And so when the first Halloween came around and Soul Spark was, art was in business, I had to do a vernacular project because I don't think we've done a James and the Giant Peach now. now I'm going to have to look up some of these. I never thought about doing Watership Down, but now I'm thinking. So you can't see the look on my face, but my hamster wheel is going. It's already like thinking about all these incredible books that are so much fun to read and then to be able to draw too. So do you have a genre of books that tend to be your favorites? I tend to love very emotional, hard-hitting kind of stories. It doesn't matter necessarily the genre. I read a lot of historical fiction, but I also enjoy sci-fi and horror. I just really, for whatever reason, I've always been drawn to stories that are very dark and sad and upsetting, like the early Stephen King. Stephen King. Yeah, I've definitely read a lot of Stephen King in my youth. <laughs> but the book thief is a good example of what I love in books. I want something that's dark, but also written really beautifully. I just love that kind of story. Is there a book that you've read recently that you've thought kids aren't reading this? It's underrated, but I really wish that more kids knew about this book. It was one of the first lip bites I put out with Yonder by Ali Standish. And I loved that book. I think it was a new release last year. And I thought it was just amazing. And I wanted everyone to read it. So I wrote a lip bite for it. I was like, everyone read this book. But that one was, is so good. It's about World War II, but from the American home front. And it's about a boy who is learning about what it means to be brave. It's not what he thought it was. Brave, he thought, was like, you know, those big gestures and saving somebody and that kind of thing. But brave is also other things, too. And I just thought it was such a beautiful way to explore that. Yeah, brave is most often the little tiny things Mm -hmm. we face every day. And you mentioned that you love historical fiction. And especially, I grew up loving world history. But U.S. Mm -hmm. history is not my favorite subject. I think every single person out there has at least one subject. That as a homeschooler, we think, please let someone else teach this for us. I don't want to. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's U.S. history. So one of the things that when my kids were really little, my kids aren't that old. They're eight and almost 11. But when they were really little, I started thinking, okay, this is something I want to teach. But how do I do that in a way that's really interesting? And historical fiction is a really amazing way to do that. And then you recently, within the last year, started a website called History Book by Book. And then there is history books, but also a ton of historical fiction. So could you tell us more about that? Yeah, this was another one of those passion projects where I was just like, I wish this thing existed. Why does no one make this? And then I just decided, why am I not making this? I could do this. So what I wanted, when I'm researching a subject or a topic that I want to know more about, I go and see what books I can find. And it's so hard to find a list of history books by topic chronologically and things like that. I wanted to read about this topic. I want to find the list. And so I wanted to create that thing. And I spent a lot of time organizing book lists and creating just chronologically all the books I could find. And I try my best. I have not read everything that is in History Book by Book right now because I am only one person. (laughs) There is a lot of books books right now. I have over a thousand books listed there and I do my best to read as many of them as I can. And my goal is to review as many as possible. I try when I can to include content warnings and things for each book. The goal is just to make a resource so that if your child gets really excited about the French Revolution or whatever, that you can go and look it up and find some resources that you can add to your studies. And for yourself, too, because a lot of it is for you. A question I get asked a lot is, well, what do I read? If if my kids are studying ancient history and I wanted to learn more, what do I read? And so it does come up a lot, doesn't it? A lot of sling parents, you know, we're we're doing this and I'd like to read something, too. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, I think a big component of homeschooling is self-education because we want to do our best to teach our kids. And so this gives them resources like, okay, well, I'm really wanting to read more about ancient Egypt because my kid's really into it and I want to know more too. So now you have resources that are for both of you, for your child and for you to learn more. I love the content warnings. That way people can make their own decisions yeah. and they kind of yeah. have an idea. I know there's a lot of parents with sensitive kids. And so mm-hmm. I really appreciated that because my oldest, in particular, when she was younger, she was a really sensitive kid. She's an animal lover. And so she really got hit from the side a few times reading some things. And you just never know. And other people are absolutely fine with those things. So just knowing that they're there, I was diving deep into it and I saw the adult books and the kid books. And so I really love that you included adults in there also. That's a mention because a lot of us who have, well, I haven't yet. I have not done the thing and stuck it out to the teen years because mine are still young. But for those who are homeschooling high schoolers who have those passions too, Mm-hmm. A really beautiful way for them to be able to find those things that they want to study and learn more about in an easy way. So I know all of us appreciate you doing that. So you have all these passion projects. So what's on your plate for the future? What's next for Build Your Library? Well, right now I'm towards the end of getting all the levels updated. That was a big undertaking because, you know, you write things and then books go out of print and new books come out. So I wanted to go back and go through every level and update. So I'm on level 10. I'm hoping to get through level 12 by the middle of next year, maybe end of next year. I don't know. I honestly don't know how long it'll take me, but it's coming closer to the end of that. I have a bunch of new things I want to do. I have a running list I keep of unit study ideas. And it's just sort of like what I get the moment when I have the time, I'm going to write this. And so I have a huge running list. And right now, I know in the very near future, I'm going to be writing a World War I unit because I've been asked so many times for that because people love the World War II unit. And they're like, well, will you do one for World War I? I'm like, maybe. <laughs> so yeah. There's not a ton of resources for that. Yeah. So I've been collecting things and that is something I do want to write soon. So I've got everything ready. I just need to have the time to sit down and plot it all out. But the World War One unit is coming soonish. And I've got Lit Bites that I want to do. I've got a stack of books that I'm working my way through for Lit Bite. So yeah, there's lots of stuff happening. I just, I hate telling people that I'm making this thing because then they expect it right away. And I'm working around a lot of projects. So, you know, it takes time. So what Emily is saying is just keep an eye on the yes. lights and the unit studies because there will be more coming. There will be more oh, unit no. studies. There will be more lit bite. There may be other things on the horizon too. I don't know. I have four <laughs> years left of homeschooling and I'm going to have so much time to fill when my daughter graduates and I'm going to need Build Your Library to fill that empty hole. I, you might end up starting that brick and mortar bookstore. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what will happen. But yeah, I'm going to have a lot of extra time when she's done with school. Okay, well, we have come to the rapid fire section. So I do not tell any of my guests what these questions will be. And they're not too hard, but they're just kind of a fun way to learn a little bit more about you. So are you ready? I think so. Book in your hand, book on a device or book read to you. Book in the hand? I think, yeah. True or false? You can't judge a book by its cover. False. <laughs> bookmark, no bookmark, or dog ear? Bookmark. Coffee or tea? Tea. If I could meet any author, it would be? Gosh, Stephen King. Should have seen that one, Zoe. Early bird or night owl? Neither. I'm great in the middle of the day. Which is exactly what we're doing this podcast for this question. Now, Kenny, when I'm not reading, you can find me. Probably, oh gosh, what am I doing when I'm not reading? Probably scrolling Instagram, if I'm being honest. This is how much she loves books, everyone. This is why you need to head over to build your library. (laughs) Okay, favorite cartoon from childhood. Oh my gosh. Oh, the, the, oh, what is it called? The Winnie the Pooh? But which one is it? It was like the 1990s. Oh, oh! you know, the one that had the gopher. Oh, corner? Yeah, I don't know. Was it called that? I just remember it's Winnie the Pooh and Gopher. 
Gopher was there. I don't know the name of it, though. Yeah, I don't remember either, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, loved that. Okay, playing Monopoly, I always chose this piece. Oh, gosh, it has been so long since I played Monopoly. Now I can't remember any of the pieces. Is it one of them an iron? Yes. I'm going to go with that. I never wanted to fight over the dog, so I always chose the iron because no one ever wanted to be the iron. (laughs) And I was just always consistent. So that's funny that you mentioned that. Okay, last one. How do you feel about glitter? Oh, I despise it. I'm sorry. (laughs) That's why I had to leave that one to the very last. So Emily, it has been an absolute pleasure. Where can everyone find you? We're going to link to everything in the show notes, but on socials. So you have YouTube. I am on YouTube at ARG Schooling. I also have an Instagram under ARG Schooling. I'm on Instagram as Build Your Library. And I'm on Facebook as Build Your Library. And yeah, that's basically where I'm at most of the time, Instagram and YouTube. Okay, so we're going to link to all of her socials as well as we'll put a separate link to the online bookstore. I know it's on your Build Your Library page, but we'll put a separate link in there to make sure that everyone can head right there. And also your history book by book for those looking for incredible resources when you're feeling stuck, which I know history is one of those areas that people feel stuck a lot, a lot, a lot. So thank you so much for joining me today. It has been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. I would love to have you back sometime to talk more books because I know this is a topic you and I are both passionate about, but I feel like every single homeschooler out there, it's on the homeschool requirement list to be passionate about books. Yeah, it does come with the territory. It does. <laughs> okay, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. Until next time. 